Hi, today we are in the wonderful and sunny Munich with Altruja and Nico. Nico, who are you and what do you do? Hi, first of all, welcome. Great to have you guys here in Munich. Um, my name is Nico. I'm one of the founders of Altruja and we do online fundraising for nonprofit organizations. That means we, um, we built a software that nonprofit organizations, which are our clients, can integrate into their own websites uh, to collect donations. So basically, it's payment processing for nonprofit organizations. When and why did you start this company? We started uh, right about four years ago, so in the March of 2010. And uh, why is a good question. Actually, I, I lived in the US, in San Diego, uh, where I did my, my master's, my MBA. Uh, and after my MBA, I worked for a software company that did online registration for business events, sport events, etc. So, for example, the Los Angeles Marathon. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the tools that they had is they, they had a charity tool. So if you're running the LA Marathon, and they would ask you, hey, it's great you're running the marathon, why don't you raise money for LA's kids charity? Uh, and a lot of people were doing this. And so when I was checking back and forth with my friends and I was looking how, how this is done in, in the rest of the world, I saw that there's something similar in Australia and England, but nothing in Central Europe. Like there's nothing how nonprofit organizations were able to collect money easy and, uh, and secure and fast. Uh, it was a very, very costly process. Uh, so when I moved back in 2009, um, that idea kind of stuck with me and uh, yeah, I decided to use this opportunity and build a company. Did your former employee in any way cooperate with you or did you just build everything from scratch? Actually, um, well, so this company in the US, um, when, I, when I came over, I kind of like, I took some of the ideas with me, but none of the technology. Okay. Actually, when I started here in, in, in Munich, I, I, was, uh, um, I was good friends with the founders of Amiando. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you still know them, they were uh, acquired by, by Xing Events. And, um, and actually, our initial idea was to build up like an Amiando for charities. Because the idea of integrating a tool into a website and do payment processing is very similar to their technology. Uh, but pretty quickly we realized we should we should build a, build up a second company for that. Uh, however, those guys were, were very supportive. They're actually our first investors and shareholders is Amiando and the founders themselves. Um, so uh, we did not take any of the technology, but obviously they were very helpful in, in making the first introductions and, and helping us getting the company started. So that means that now a very little, little portion of us belongs actually to Xing or now to Burda. <laughs> I don't, but I don't know if they know. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the business model of Catch Um Can you briefly explain mm -hmm. really how it works? Who are your customers mm -hmm. uh, and how you are making money? And I can actually also tell you how, how the business model shifted over the, over the past because sure. it, that happened like three, four times probably. Um, so again, our clients um, and our customers are non-profit organizations. So that means uh, by definition in our, in our uh, terms, we only work with uh, foundations, clubs, political parties, etc. All those that are eligible and, and need donations to run their projects. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, um, it's, it's actually a quite big market. So alone in, in, in Germany, uh, or German-speaking part of Europe, um, every year like six to seven billion uh, euros are donated every year. But only a very small portion of that is donated mm -hmm. online. So far like, I don't know, one to two percent maybe. Whereas in the US, we're up to 10, 15, 20%. So it means nonprofit organizations waste a lot of money on uh, mail marketing, like postcards. My, my parents during Christmas season get hundreds of postcards from SOS, Children's Village, UNICEF, etc. Uh, and 99% of those get trashed in the mail. Uh, another way to, uh, to get donations is like people, especially students, on the street uh, and like asking people to, to, to chip in donations, uh, uh, posters and all that stuff is very, very costly. So our system in the beginning worked like this, that we offered them the tool completely for free uh, and charging them a percentage fee of whatever we were raising for them. It was like 9.9%. Um, that resulted in that some of our clients that are uh, that were using our tool very efficiently were paying us a lot of money, which was nice for us, but it was a lot of money for them. Um, on the other hand, many of our organizations that were raising very little money um, were probably causing the same trouble for us or the same work, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe if they only raised 50 euros a month, we were sending them an invoice for 3 euros 85 cents, okay. something like that. 
So that means we shifted our our uh, model now to something where we um, we charge them like a, a software fee. Mm -hmm. and it's very low. It's like 59 euros for the software per month. And in, in that included is a, is a volume to to uh, collect like donations, like 5,000 euros of donations, mm -hmm. for example. So it's an, in, in essence, it's a it's a software as a service. Mm -hmm. you know, we rent out the software, and if they want, we do the payment processing for them. That's pretty much the, the business model. Okay, and do you have different pricing points? Mm -hmm. Like, can you tell us about that? So initially, we had uh, like different prices for we have like we have like three different tools, like one for raising money with with friends and and, and, and like your peer to peers mm -hmm. uh, the other one was uh, raising money with companies and the other one the last one was just like a simple basic donation form um, so we had different prices for them realizing that it was actually way too complicated so like different volumes different tools way too complicated now we just threw everything together mm -hmm. and now the only difference we make is by the volume that you that you raise because we pay all the credit card fees yeah so that's basically hopefully you use a lot of our tools and you raise as much money as, as, as possible for your for, for the organization but for us the only difference makes how much is it because um, that's where our cost structure lies okay understood and um Can you tell us about how the product is integrated with the nonprofit organizations? It's actually very simple. So it's kind of you can imagine like if you would integrate a YouTube video into your organization's website. Mm -hmm. So um, you get a two-line HTML code from us, copy that, paste it into the website, and, uh, and and that's basically from a technical perspective. That's it. So we need maybe five minutes of the web admin. That's that's it. And after that, the person who is responsible for for the fundraising for the donations. Can change the text, the color, the image, the font. It's as easy to like using a Windows PC. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very easy. Um, all the payment processing, all the, the critical part happens in this frame in ours. So that means the charity does not have to worry about uh, uh, data privacy, about the credit card safety, uh, about payment processing, about all that mm -hmm. stuff. That happens in our website that is integrated into their website. However, the, the donor, the person that wants to donate, does not realize any of this. Okay. He just realizes, oh, look, the charity has now a pretty cool tool on the website. Uh, we're like the good guys in the background, making sure that everything runs smoothly. And does it only work like this, that I, let's say, integrate this plugin uh, on, on my website, and then the users that are coming to my website as a non-profit organization just click on it, donate some money, you take care of the uh, payment processing, etc., I get my... Uh, money every month mm -hmm. or so and that's it or do you also uh, focus on providing some other services and values to, to the nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. so the first one was that was like the basic tool that is that is like the bread and butter that's what most organizations uh, need to get started because like getting on the website making donation that's that's like the must have yeah. um, on top of that if if, uh, if the organizations want to increase the, the donations and get more donate donors to to get to their site That's when we use our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising tool, as we call it. So, for example, let's say you run the marathon mm -hmm. and you want to support Amnesty International. Like, for example, during the Munich Marathon or Vienna Marathon, we work with those, you can create your own little page. It can be like the, whatever, Joe Smith runs the Munich Marathon site for Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. And you can invite all your friends. You say, like, I'm running the marathon and please uh, help me to raise 1,000 euros for, for, uh, for Amnesty International. Now all your friends can donate and help you to achieve your goal. And those will be people that probably would have never donated for Amnesty before, but because they're friends with you, mm -hmm. they chipped in. So for example, we had one young girl, she's a young woman, she's uh, 32. She um, started a, a campaign for uh, an organization from Hamburg uh, last weekend, last Friday. And over the weekend, in four days, she raised 7,000 euros wow. from her friends. So just imagine that a young lady, 32 years old, raising 7,000 euros within four days from people all over the world, basically, because they were friends with her mm -hmm. and they wanted to help her to achieve her goal. And that's obviously for a, for a non-profit organization, uh, that's gold. Like They would have never been able to, to reach those new donors. Okay, let's talk about a corporate strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're thinking of Altruia as a service provider for non-profit organizations, mm -hmm. What do you need to do in the next years in order to create some competitive advantage over other ways to raise donations? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, for, for us, um, it, it's an advantage that more and more, I mean, nowadays more and more organizations have to go online. It's, uh, 
and it's sometimes very shocking that how little they know uh, in the in the web space because um, obviously most donors for organizations are a little bit older. Yeah. They're mostly our parents. So until now, they did not have to deal with their website and that stuff. But we, we get now the feeling that this is changing. Like they're very interested. They're interested in learning more about this. Uh, and, and to answer your question, I think this is where we, where we need to step up more and where we want to step up more to provide them with the knowledge because it's not enough just to give them the software. That's yeah. probably what we did in the beginning. Just like, here's the software. You, it's, it's great. You can use a lot of tools. And they were like, okay, uh, great, but I don't have a driver's license to drive this car. Like they don't know what to, yeah. what to do with it and how to target new donors online. Um, so now we, we work with them and, and help them to, to, to be a better online user, mm -hmm. how to use social media, how to create an email campaign, uh, how to improve their websites. Like you would not believe like they have yeah. websites and you, you want to give them money. You have to search for like five minutes to, and then find the, the IBAN number, like then you can write down the IBAN number and that's it. So we, ha we have to help them like improving their online strategy at all. And, uh, and I think if we're able to do that, then as a, their online donations will follow after that. So uh, you are telling me that you are trying to go into this kind of advising or consulting business and, and creating some revenue streams there as well? Yes and no. You're right in the consulting, but not in the manual consulting. So we, we, we had to do that. And I believe that probably a lot of a lot of startups have to do that in the beginning because it's direct cash. Like yeah. if, if you consult someone, you get money right away. Uh, and that's probably good, especially in the beginning. However, it's very hard to scale. So uh, we try to get out of that as much as possible. Um, well, however, we still do that because I guess we need money. But um, we try to make a lot of those things uh, automatic now. Mm -hmm. So that means like uh, setting up a, a, like an email newsletter that teaches them every week a new thing in social media, mm -hmm. uh, but like tailored to, to uh, non-profit organizations. So, and I think that's the only way, because I mean, up to now we have like 500 organizations that we support now from like uh, big national, international organizations like Amnesty to very small local animal shelters, like just everything from kids to nature and everything. But the only way to scale that is if you do it automatically. Okay. Uh, if you're thinking about switching costs, let's like, assume I am a non-profit organization mm -hmm. and I want to use, because I realized uh, that uh, online marketing is important, I want mm -hmm. to use your tool or other tools for creating donations on my website. Mm -hmm. um, how do you try to integrate with this non-profit organization so they don't have an incentive to switch to other providers? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, because we, we do a really good job. <laughs> hopefully, because um, they, they get everything that they need, they get from us, hopefully. Uh, we have the feeling that the money and the price, as long as it's in the same, in the same ballpark, is, is not a reason why they would switch. It's not for five euros, more or less. Um, because they have to trust us uh, with two most important things that they have a with their money and b with their donor data they have we control and we help them to to control their the data of their donors mm -hmm. um, so the level of trust has to be really high already so if, if we do a good job and don't violate that which we don't do so far uh, there's not not really a reason to switch for for one tool or another did I get it right that the um, nonprofit organizations don't have the user or donate donor d d data that um, donated via your online tool? They get it. No, no. They get it. No, okay. Absolutely. No, we just help them to like. So, for example, like we have one uh, IT guy who who deals solely with credit card with payment security. Yeah. So that means it would not make sense for 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 an organization, not even a big one, to hire someone who deals with credit card security. But for us, it makes sense because he is able to help 500 yeah, organizations yeah. at one point. So that, that means like all the data privacy protection stuff we do for them so that they don't have to deal with it. Okay. But obviously the data is theirs. I guess so like we don't we just collect it for them. Yeah, understood. Let's talk about the market development and for the donation. Uh, and you, you said one very interesting fact that in Europe, most of the non-profit organizations raise currently their money via offline sources. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the donation sizes in Europe, maybe in Germany, and then which trends do you see? And maybe what um, limitations we currently have, which need to be dissolved in order to increase the online donation share? Mm -hmm. So maybe some of the statistics. Um, so as I said, about five to six, seven billion euros are donated every year here in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, this, 
in this uh, market space. Um, it obviously it, it varies if there's like a catastrophe like Haiti or something, then obviously th that number goes up. Um, and as I said before, about last year, I think it was 1.8% of that money is donated online. Mm -hmm. So you already get the feeling like compared to buying f flights, books and uh, insurance stuff online, finding your, I don't know, your husband, future wife online, all that happens now more and more. Donations is very, very in the back of that. So already that has to change or is changing because the people donating are the ones that are working now in, I don't know, in an office with a computer. So everything moves there from alone mm -hmm. to, to the online space. Um, the average donation is actually online a lot higher, about three times as high as offline. Mm -hmm. So for example, our average donation last year was 87 euros wow. um, compared to the average offline donation that we get from the, um, from the organizations uh, was 29. So 29 to 87. Uh, and um, the main reason we think for that is that the average person, it, it, you're not going online for a five euro donation. That was maybe a misconception in the beginning that young students that are online would chip in five euros. It's not the case. We get every day 500 euros, 1,000 euros, 100 euros, where people sit in front of the computer, they want to help, they want to do something, they take out their credit card, and, and you're not putting out a credit card for 7 euro 50 for sure. They do 100 euro donations. Yeah. Uh, and also one other thing is that uh, credit card donations are a lot higher mm -hmm. than, than the typical direct debit uh, donation. And we think because maybe there's a different demographic because not everyone has a credit card. If you have one and you shop online, you're usually donating a little bit more. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, this, this, <laughs> this, this answered my question in, uh, in terms of the current status. Yeah, okay. And what I would be interested in, um, what limitations are there? So mm -hmm. why are there only 1.8% mm -hmm. uh, of the total international yeah. market online right now? I, I got it. Um, so I think, again, two, two main reasons. A, because indeed most donors are older and we will not convince the, 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 the 85 year old lady to, to switch online now if she has never done online banking, if she never bought a flight online or anything like that, chances are high we probably will not convince her. So there will be a shift just by the, the demographic that will move into the donation demographic in the next couple of years. So, and that is what happened in, in, in the US and in the UK and stuff. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the clients have to change. They have to adapt to this shift to to um, to kind of bring this demographic forward. Uh, so, for example, as I said before, there's there's websites that are horrible. There's websites that are ten years old and older. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you if you have a website like that and you only send out your newsletters via post ev once every year, why should you get online donations? So organizations have to start collecting email addresses, yeah. with, which sounds logical for all of us, but for many in those organizations, and, and I understand, I mean, there's people that work part-time or just as volunteers, they have a regular job and on the weekend now they have to build up an email newsletter, which is something new for them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard shift and that's where we want to step in and help them to automate that stuff and, and, and make the first step towards progress in, in the modernization of the organizations. Nico, what would be your forecast for the next 20 years once the current generation who is donating a lot of money and is older uh, is not donating because mm -hmm. they are out of business, uh, but that the younger generation, are they still donating as much as the current gener mm -hmm. generation or do you think even more or less? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different approaches to that. First, um, people tend to donate more once they reach certain age groups because like obviously as a young person you have to pay for your education bringing up your family buying your first house car whatever that stuff and as soon as that's done as that's settled uh, people have more spending money um, so that's why they usually spend more when they get older so I, I'm, I'm not afraid that people in five ten years will donate less but what will change probably um, or is changing already is how people donate so for example my parents uh, I think for the past 30 years, every year they donate for SOS Children's Village by mm -hmm. like automatically every yeah. year, same amount. Um, so that changes now that younger folks, younger people tend to donate more on a project base. Mm -hmm. So you see like, okay, there's a, there's a project, I want to I wanna help Amnesty International for this project, I want to help Greenpeace for this. And so people tend to be less loyal for an organization um, because they maybe also, because of the World Wide Web now, they're able to look at new and different projects that appeal more and more to them. There's more and more organizations coming up every year. Uh, uh, for example, if like five years ago you wanted to, or 20 years you wanted to do something for nature, there's like Greenpeace, WWF, and I don't know, that's it. Now every every gorilla in Indonesia has its own charity on every island, probably. Yeah. So there's more and more small organizations. Um, so I think that that 
that changes and that will change how people donate. And um, But once one of the tools that we provide, this peer-to-peer -peer fundraising tool, I think it helps young people that don't have as much money, like the women that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. but she still wants to get active and do something, but she has friends and family and all, like her uncle that is now able to donate so she can do something good without spending thousands of euros, but still she's able to do a lot of difference. Because it's project-based. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and uh, can you briefly explain the market development in worldwide maybe and uh, how, uh, the market dy dynamics in terms of um, the, the, the competitors uh, and, and how they act in, in the US, for example, because I mean, from my understanding, the US is quite a big don uh, donor market Absolutely. And, um, and maybe how the competitive situation is there in Europe and maybe how they, uh, yeah, the, the dynamics are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So in the, in the US, uh, I think it was last year over 300 billion euros donated, wow. uh, like generally, like compared to our six to seven billion. So it's just like whoosh, big difference. It's not only because of the size of the market; uh, it's uh, also because different. Uh, it's a different culture. They pay less taxes. There's nothing like church tax, which we have in Germany here. Uh, but people donate a lot more on a community basis. It's you donate for your school, your university, all that stuff, which we don't have here. That's why there's a lot more donations over there. Um, that's that's one thing. Um, the, the competitive uh, uh, structure here in Germany is, I mean, there's two to three other software providers that do something similar like we do. Uh, obviously, everyone has their small little niche uh, and define their own little niche. Um, but we, right now, we compete maybe for this 1.8% one one of the market slice, right? I mean, the, the, the main competitor that we all share is offline. Right? Is the postcard, is the mailing, is the person on the street that costs a lot more money than, than raising money online. So um, actually we think, I don't know about them, but uh, we think of our competitors like we all together have to make this slice of the pie a lot bigger. And, and if we're able to do that, then the market is big enough for all of us. Right? I mean, but, but still, uh, everyone has their own little features and, 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 and strengths and weaknesses. Uh, um, so, but we still think there's Everybody's helping to make the pie bigger. Mm -hmm. Nico, we from Entrepreneurial Insights, we always try to give some first-time entrepreneurs some advice so they make less errors. Uh, what advice could you give? You maybe your best friend or so. <laughs> no, I mean I, I think a lot about uh, like sharing is caring in, in, in this case. So uh, um, I think that's the good stuff that you did. You a good job that you guys do because I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, mistakes that, that people can avoid if, if they if they don't do the mistake for the first time. So, for example, um, one thing is like share your idea. Uh, I I don't believe in that it would be a good idea to to simply keep my idea uh, secret and not talk to anybody because if they steal the idea, they will they will make the next next Facebook, Skype, eBay, whatever. That's not going to happen. If your idea is that weak that someone can just take it away because he heard it once uh, then it's not a good idea yeah. right um, so um, we were pretty open about our idea talk to investors to com yeah, even competitors uh, to clients uh, when we were still on PowerPoint structure um, because we got a lot of feedback from them like they got a lot of critical feedback a lot of good uh, feedback um, but it helped us a lot to grow the idea so be open about what you uh, what you try to try to build The second thing is I would say is um, think about money pretty quickly. Um, so we had the exist uh, stipend at the beginning um, and I just saw a lot of other founders um, that were trying to build a product. They were thinking, hey, I have those uh, 2,000, I think 2,500 now euros a month. Uh, that will be enough to get the product started uh, and to generate some cash flow. And then after 12 months, I will be profitable and I don't need investors. <laughs> It's not probably not going to happen. If Good job, but uh, it did not happen for us. And we were pretty quickly, I think from day one, uh, we started to talk to investors because everything will take longer. It's just learning from everybody. Um, so, and we also took those investors very early on to get feedback from them. So meaning after uh, a while, after we talked to them, we were not new to them. So we even talked to them when we did not want the money. Uh, so. Building up this relationship will take some time, but I think you should get started as early as possible. Right? Um, third thing would be, but again, obviously that depends on, on the business, I think is get the product out as fast as possible. This is again feedback related because the, like you can sit in your in your ivory tower and, and, and think a lot, lot about what the, the clients want. Um, 
just build it as fast and quick and cheap as possible, get it out and, and, and get some real feedback. Um, and then you have some real feedback to, to work into the product. Uh, so we, we called it um, progress, not perfection. It's mm -hmm. kind of like one of our mantras. So it, as long as you move along, it's, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's only 80% right. Yeah. right. Obviously, if you do brain surgery, that should not be the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Nico. And as Nico said, sharing is caring. So, what do you do with this video? Thanks. <laughs>